Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Little Dudes Insect Academy podcast with your host, Braden Coy, and I could not be more excited to be here with my new friend, George. Uh, we met at the ESA conference back in November a while back, uh, but we're back, and we are so excited to talk about bugs with you guys for a little bit. Uh, so I'm super excited about this episode, so without further ado, uh, go ahead and introduce yourself for us, George. Yeah, so I'm George Todd. I uh, am originally from Carmel, Indiana, which is in the Indianapolis area of Indiana, and uh, lived there uh, most of my life, and then also lived in uh, South Georgia for several years, and now I, I currently live in St. Louis, and I am a PhD student in biology and at the University of Missouri-St. Louis studying uh, insect pollinators. Amazing. Yeah, and we'll we'll dive all into your research in just a minute, but uh, yeah, let's talk a little bit more about your schooling. So uh, let's go back to the beginning. Where where did you go to school for your undergrad, and uh, what have you kind of done so far through throughout your schooling career? So I went to Purdue University for my undergrad degree, a Bachelor of Science awesome. in Biology. Purdue's a Big Ten school. It's Indiana's land-grant university. Um, really great school. Uh, of course, I'm biased to that. <laughs> but yeah. uh I, so I studied biology and took a lot of the typical classes there, but I also discovered a more specific interest in animal behavior and physiology mm. as, as a kind of subfield within that. And I, through the encouragement of my, my advisor, my academic advisor, and a couple other students that I knew older than me, I decided to pursue, pursue joining uh, one or two different labs in the biology department uh, at new to get involved and see what what research entailed, what it was like. And so I joined I was in two different labs. The first lab I joined, it was actually uh, in the uh, food science department. Mm -hmm. and that lab was investigating bioavailability of different kinds of uh, molecules and things, and they used, um, uh, pigs and um, Zucker rats as hmm. study systems to investigate that. And so I, in that lab, I did more basic things, which comprised mostly husbandry duties. So taking care of the animals. And I also did some basic uh, data collection for one of the uh, PhD students that was in the lab. Okay. So that was, that was a, I think, a good opportunity to get my feet wet in research. And then the second lab I was involved in was a bird behavior and physiology lab mm. that studied behavior and physiology in birds. And so I worked with a postdoc specifically in that lab, studying the foraging behavior of house sparrows. So how mm. they how they looked for and obtained food in particular against different colored backgrounds and in different environmental contexts. Mm. Uh, and so I got more involved in that process and actually presented uh, some of that research at a couple of different conferences. And so that was that was really great for my professional development. Yeah, uh, I decided I wanted to as I was getting to graduation, I wanted to pursue a master's degree. And so I had actually met somebody at a conference in Austin, Texas, who was he was a professor at Georgia Southern University, and he was looking for a new master's student to do research studying animal behavior in snakes. Mm. Uh, and so completely different kind of animal, obviously, yeah. but the, the underlying questions that he was trying to address were very similar. And so I actually emailed him at the conference and met him the next day. And one thing led to another and I applied to the school and got accepted. And so I went and got a master's degree at Georgia Southern University, which is a uh, very far South Georgia, kind of getting towards the coast. Um, and I studied uh, thermoregulatory behavior in corn snakes. Mm. Specifically. Uh, so that was, a, that was a very great experience. And something else of note that I did also was I was a teaching assistant. So I was on a TA. That's great. And I was, you know, super anxious about it. I, I did it just to be able to get the tuition waiver and get a stipend. It's right. very common for graduate students. But yeah. slowly I began to realize that I, there were certain aspects about teaching that I actually enjoyed and found fulfilling. Mm -hmm. And as I was getting towards graduation, I was really aiming initially more towards getting a job in field biology um, and uh, or the conserva in conservation or wildlife biology work. 
but I decided to broaden what I was looking for and also include different kinds of teaching jobs if they popped up. And in fact, one did at a technical college about a couple hours away from there, teaching primarily dual enrollment high school students, uh, general biology, mm. as well as traditional students on campus during the summers. And I, that kind of, that kind of unique uh, dynamic in that job kind of appealed to me. And so I applied and, and got the job. And so I moved to Waycross, Georgia, just a couple hours away. And I taught at Coastal Pines Technical College for five years. Oh, wow. Um, and so that, yeah, I was there for a little while. <laughs> and I, I did, as much as I like the high school students, I did kind of miss teaching undergraduates. And mm. I also wanted to be able to mentor undergraduates and research yeah. experiences, and I really wasn't getting that in that job. It's just a different so, environment for sure. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And so that led me to realize I think I'm going to have to get a PhD uh, just because even with a master's degree, it's very difficult to get non-adjunct or non-part-time mm. uh, jobs right. uh, teaching teaching in higher education. And so I spent a couple years applying to schools didn't get into didn't get into some of them and i discovered professor amy dunlap my advisor's uh, research in her lab here at umsel and really really liked the things she was questions she was uh, asking and using insect pollinators as mm -hmm. a study system mm -hmm. and so i applied and got accepted and i actually met my wife and married in Waycross, Georgia. And so both her and I moved uh, here to St. Louis That's in great. all of 2021. And so now I'm in year three of the PhD program and making good progress and it's going, going well. That's awesome. Yeah. So, I mean, you've done it all. You've done snakes, lots of snakes, birds, uh, and you're just now doing insects, right? Because you didn't really do much of that before. Correct. Yeah. So what, what led you to that? Um, and what have you been doing with your, uh, pollinator research? I, again, I really, I, I applied to different schools at, at the time. I applied to different schools and there were different kinds of animals that these labs were investigating mm -hmm. and doing, doing research with. And I was not particularly picky about what study system I use because I, at that point, had already had some diversity of different, very different kinds of animals. Right. But this work with insects just was particularly interesting to me. And one thing I can remember specifically is I had a Zoom meeting with a couple of grad students in her lab at the time. They're, they're both graduated now, but I had a Zoom meeting with them just to get their perspective on what it's like being in the Dunlap lab at UMSL, what the department's like, what life mm -hmm. in St. Louis is like, all those mm -hmm. things. And they spoke really highly of those things in general, but then when they talked about their specific research and other things that were happening in the lab, that that kind of really piqued my interest. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And uh, I, I'd, I'd, always lo I'd always loved insects, uh, just hadn't really... I kind of knew knew a lot of the basic things that you learn in biology uh, about insects, a lot of the different right. kinds of groups, mm -hmm. their life history and evolution and ecological roles, all of those kinds of things. But I discovered that there's just a whole other a whole other level that you can dive into, and yeah. it's been, it's been really fascinating. So, uh, and what I do right now is most of my lab actually works with bumblebees. And they study the, the lab studies uh, cognition in particular in mm. insect pollinators, and so cognition is just the the thought process, the process that the the brain goes through in different stages, starting with uh, sensing the environment, processing that information. Uh, is there memory of mm. that information involved potentially, and then ultimately making a decision based on that information gained. So that entire cognitive process. You can actually study that very well in insects, and a lot of things have been learned in doing that. And so other people in my lab do study bumblebees, and you can order bumblebee colonies commercially. So mm -hmm. they'll actually ship you a bumblebee colony, and you take them one by one out of the box that they're shipped, shipped in, and you put them in an in a enclosure in the lab, mm -hmm. and you provide them everything that they need, food resources, uh, you clean the space, of course. Wow. Um, and so I was initially, when I was 
brainstorming what I wanted my PhD dissertation to be on. I was thinking about a lot of things with bumblebees, of course, but I was also thinking about other insect pollinators like butterflies and moths, yeah. uh, beetles. Uh, there are also fly pollinators, though, and I discovered a group of flies called hoverflies. Mm. Most people call them most people call them sweat bees, but they're actually flies that mimic bees and wasps. So yeah. they will have a lot of the yellow and black coloration patterns of bees and wasps. And I did not really know, honestly, if they existed mm. <laughs> prior yeah. to coming into the program. And I discovered them and also discovered that the the case can be made that they're actually like the second most important pollinator group in the world so really? most people pretty unanimously agree that bees are the most important group both yeah. um, ecologically as well as economically for, yeah. for human food crops but as soon as you start to go down that list it gets a little fuzzy you can make different arguments about you know which groups are more important than others right. uh, but but hoverflies have a very strong case to really be the second most important group and so i when i learned that i figured Okay, there's a good amount of bee research that's been done and about their cognition in the process of pollination. So if hoverflies are almost as important, you'd figure there might be a little less research done on them, but still maybe somewhat in the same ballpark. But right. it turns out that's really not the case. Mm. Bumblebee research is like up, or sorry, bee research is up here, and then yeah. hoverfly research is like way down here. Really? So there's a very huge there's a very huge gap in knowledge in the literature and I decided I'm going to write a dissertation and try to fill in just a tiny piece of that gap in knowledge about hoverfly cognition. So, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So um, for those at home who don't know what, like go over the hoverfly and uh, why are they like so interesting and special? Sure. So they're unique in two ways. So they they are they're in the order of insects called diptera, which is just the true flies. So there are there are flies that have the word the, the word fly in them that actually aren't in this group. So for example, dragonflies yeah. are not true flies. Yep. <laughs> um, and there's a number of other things, but the dipteran flies are true flies, mm -hmm. and hoverflies fall within this group, and they are typically characterized as uh, m many of them do not have interesting coloration patterns. You have a lot of flies, different flies that are black, or gray, or brown, or some mix of of those. But hoverflies are, are unique, as I said, in that they exhibit coloration patterns that are believed to be a form of Batesian mimicry of, mm. of bees and wasps, which means that they exhibit uh, coloration patterns that are very similar to another type of animal uh, to act as a as a defense mechanism against potential predators. Mm. And so these hoverflies, as adults, they exhibit that, but then also their larval form are very interesting. So the, their maggot form or their larval form, mm -hmm. they're ecologically relevant because a lot of hoverfly larvae uh, actually consume a lot of uh, crop pests, such as oh. aphids. Okay. And other things and so that's very relevant for for humans just because there are a lot of crop pests that cause hmm. a massive amount of uh, monetary damage to crops and so aphids are a big one but a lot of hoverfly larvae the hoverflies hoverflies will lay their eggs on the plants they'll hatch into larvae and the larvae will start eating the aphids or other things hmm. so i did not know that yeah so there's some research going into potentially uh supplementing different areas of farmland or Areas where you grow food with with hoverfly hoverflies bringing adults in somehow or even just larvae uh, to try to uh, help as a as a natural natural defense against these pests that these flies provide um, mm. and so also what i tell people is that it's compared to my other lab mates that study bumblebees it's nice to work with hoverflies because they don't sting yeah <laughs> Mm -hmm. um there are no yeah there are no uh, flies that that sting and so although the hoverflies look like bees and wasps they actually are harmless to humans so they can't they can't sting you um mm. uh, occasionally i'll have another person in the lab they'll they'll get the a bee will get out and um they'll still sting somebody that just happens and we have precautionary safety measures in place for that but working with hoverflies i don't have to worry about that yeah, and that, that's that's so awesome. Yeah, um, how about the? I actually don't know much about hoverflies, so this is super interesting to me. Um, what what's like the distribution? Are they like where where are they native to? So hover there are about sixty three hundred species oh, wow. described uh, globally. Mm -hmm. 
and they are found in basically every part of the world except for the extreme poles so mm -hmm. the so in antarctica and then kind of the extreme arctic mm -hmm. uh so that's that's fairly common of, wow. of other kinds of insect groups that are also just found globally it, it's really hard to find insects above um uh <clears throat> a certain latitude mm -hmm. on either on either pole. So there are hoverflies over in Europe and Asia that are different from the hoverfly species in uh, North America there, but there's ones that are in South America and Africa and Australia. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. That's, that's so cool. Uh, yeah. And are they all about the same size or are there small ones and bigger ones or are they, uh, there so are the there are small there are ones that are quite small that are almost fruit fly sized so oh, wow. fruit flies fruit flies are quite small and so there are some species that kind of approach that and then on the other end there are flies that are like horse fly sized uh, mm -hmm. so yeah kind of showing showing the finger size yeah so the the little tiny ones you know are fruit fly sized but there are there are others that are maybe like this big mm -hmm. um so pretty pretty decent size range. Yeah, that that's really awesome. Um super interesting. Yeah, this is this is really cool. Um yeah, so they have like a unique flight pattern, right? They don't really like a different wing kind of, right? Am I am I being correct there? So they actually their wings aren't really particularly unique. It's their ability to hover and so that's mm. in the, in the name. Yeah. The hoverfly and so most flies uh, and most insects actually don't have the capacity to hover in one spot in the air. Uh, there are actually a, there are actually some bees that can do that. And so there's there's exceptions throughout all insects. Uh, mm -hmm. But hoverflies as a group, there are, are a lot of species that have the ability to hover. And uh, hovering is very useful in spatial navigation and getting getting your bearings. Uh, making decisions about where to fly next, what to mm -hmm. chase, if it's a male chasing away another male, for example. So there's certain advantages that come with being able to hover. Um, sometimes it can be advantageous for pollinating. And so these these adult hoverflies uh, pollinate flowers and being able to hover can provide certain advantages if the, the, the positioning of the flower is difficult to try to navigate by landing on it. Yeah. Being able to hover can be useful there too. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, super, super, super interesting. Um, when you brought up your the research on uh cognition, I'm kind of interested in that. How how is that a measurable thing? Like, how do you, is it video? Like, do you video it or, uh, like how is that a, uh, um, how can you measure that? It's that's that's interesting to me. Sure. So at the sensory stage, determining what uh, things what animals can sense. Uh, uh, such as through vision or or smell or taste or those different things. You mm -hmm. generally have two means, and this kind of extends out more broadly to studying both behavior and physiology. So you can you can take a physiological route and perform dissections and mm -hmm. actually look for specific specific, for example, like uh, photoreceptors in the eye. You can look for specific structures like on the antennae and the antennae, which are used in insects to, to smell. You can look for certain kinds of sensory hairs that are on the antennae, or mm. you can look at the densities of the hairs. So that's kind of a more physiological route, but you can also take behavioral routes and set up experiments where you present different kinds of environments mm. and you, you either record or observe in real time the different decisions. Uh, in response to these certain environments that they make, mm -hmm. and that tells you information about uh, that can reveal what kinds of things they're sensing about the environment, which things they aren't. And so, the, there's some there's some researchers who like to use those kind those two kinds of avenues in tandem together to to make some more powerful conclusions. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's also even genetic uh, component, a genetic route you can take and look for specific kinds of genes that we have identified wow. as uh, being genes that, that ultimately code for creating a certain kind of receptor cell or, mm. or protein or something like that. So I guess kind of three different avenues you can take. Uh, and that's, that's, that's for sensory as, as an example. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, super bizarre. Um, yeah. So like, uh, what, species do you work with or do you work with 
um, you know, all the native ones in St. Louis? I work with the native ones in St. Louis. Mm -hmm. And in my first couple of years in the program, I spent the spring and summers doing some basic survey work to see what kinds of species are around in St. Louis, and then mm -hmm. also what their relative abundance levels are, or in other words, like how easy or difficult is it to find them in different areas. Right. So I, I have a number of a number of sites and areas in the St. Louis, in, in, in St. Louis, uh, some of them are actually quite urban. Uh, and so you can find, find hoverflies in urban areas, mm -hmm. which is also uh, which is also kind of nice. Some some insects, you just like really don't find them in urban areas for various reasons, whereas others are quite urban adapted and do mm -hmm. fine. Uh, and so there are there are a number of hoverfly species that do seem to do quite fine in urban areas, which makes it easier to find them. You know, you don't have to go way out to a natural area 50 miles away or something. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would say there there is a list of about about 10 species or so that I can real, can say with confidence that I would be able to go out, say in this upcoming field season, I'm about to embark on later in the spring and in the summer. Yeah. There's about 10 species I could confidently say, I can go to this, 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 in this area and find at least several individuals. And uh, you use a net and you can you can net them. They're, they're a little harder to net than bees just because flies are, are more, tend to be more agile. Mm. Yeah, uh, but with with some practice, you kind of get the hang of it. Yeah, super super cool. Uh, really awesome work. Um, yeah. So, like, what is the application and like implication of this uh research? So our world is complex, right? Mm -hmm. We we uh the world's complex naturally, but then there's also a dimension of complexity that's added when humans alter and change environments. Mm. Um, and whether or not that that change is is good or bad for for people or animals ultimately it is it is still change and so animals have to contend with with that kind of environmental change mm -hmm. and um one one kind of thinking about cognition is that's one kind of specific area that you can investigate to see for example how much uh neural flexibility is there or you can think of that as as neural plasticity but how much how much flexibility is there in the brain to um to make changes based on what what's changing in the environment and so ultimately the more the more you you learn and understand the the cognitive process of a given animal the more you can make more informed decisions about say like conservation or uh, understanding what specifically about a given habitat or area is most important for a given animal species to succeed and thrive, what other kinds of species it interacts with are most important. And to give you a more specific example with these hoverflies, what really matters to them a lot for the success of their life cycle is what kinds of species of flowering plants are available. Mm, and yeah. and and how many of them there are, and that's a particularly complex thing in an urban area. Just because that you know this person's backyard may have a lot of flowers, and the next person, their neighbor, has you know like basically none, mm. and so there's just there's a ton of variability, and so these these hoverflies, along with other insect pollinators, have to contend with that, and make make decisions based on on what's provided and so understanding the cognitive process that uh, allows them to succeed that mm -hmm. that helps you understand what in the environment you might want to prioritize keeping around or not just for larger scale conservation efforts but even just to, for somebody who lives in a in the city or lives in the suburb and wants to know what they can do with their backyard to yeah. to help help pollinators and yeah yeah, so cool. Um, yeah, so George, let's let's go back, uh, take a step back a little bit, talk a little bit more about you. Um, you mentioned that uh, you've worked with you know all kinds of animals, but um, you know, uh, how did you originally get like into entomology specifically? Like, what um, was there? I mean, you 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 mentioned that your work in your PhD so far has gotten. Um, you into that but was there like a moment where you were like yeah entomology is is really cool or are you still open to 
uh, going back and working with other animals? I honestly would say I fall into the latter category mm -hmm. just because of all of the my past experience I have with those other animal groups that, that you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. And in particular, I say that just because of my, my future goals. So I ultimately want to get a teaching focused position in higher education. Right. And so I, I don't, I don't want to be a principal investigator of a, a large research lab at a research institution and have a lot of undergraduates and graduate students and postdocs all working under me and, um, have to have to constantly be writing grants and yeah. trying to look to apply for tenure and, and all of those things that kind of seems kind of overwhelming to me and mm. uh, that's just not not really what I'm like passionate about passionate right. about pursuing yep. but I'm more passionate about teaching and then also still helping facilitate and mentor undergraduate students and potentially graduate students depending on the circumstances in in research endeavors because of the research experience that I have and I kind of think of the entomology in my academic career right now as kind of another, it's another specific experience and another kind of tool that I have mm -hmm. in my arsenal to mm -hmm. use as a potential study system for, for research, uh, depending on what interests the students that I'm mentoring have. Um, I will say one nice thing about insects is that it is generally much easier to to work with them from the from the perspective of having to write protocols and get approval to have them in the lab or to yeah. do things to them. So with, yeah. with with vertebrates or mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, and fishes, mm -hmm. you you usually you usually have to write um, IACUC protocols that uh, where you explicitly state what you're planning, what your objectives are, what you're planning on doing, why those things are necessary to achieve those objectives. You have to outline that all of that very clearly to get permission to uh, go out and collect whatever or house them in the lab or do mm. X or Y or Z to them. Invertebrates, like insects, you generally don't don't have that. So you can kind of just go and collect them at will and then bring them into the lab and and do what you want, you know, which yeah. doesn't mean that you necessarily should just because we know that, that insects do experience pain. Um, but it's just kind of, it frees up a lot of time <laughs> at the very least. So mm. that's that's also been something i've i've been enjoying yeah I, that, that's a good point that i never really thought about um they're you know really uh i wouldn't say they're easy to find but um you know they're plentiful they're uh, a lot less ethical concern with bringing them in and all that stuff uh less dangerous typically um and like a lot of people have said in the past on the show it's like not, not nobody really cares if um like some die in your experiments. Uh, it, it happens all the time. So, um, yeah, so that, that's a great point that I never really thought about is, um, the, from an administrative perspective, I'm sure it's way easier to get them for the lab. Um, yeah, really, really interesting. Uh, really cool. Uh, so, um, moving on to a little bit more about you, um, um, who along the way has sort of pushed you along and inspired you uh, throughout your career so far, like a mentor or any professors or like, who's your inspiration with all of this? So even early on my, so my parents and my family, uh, just in, in general, have always like supported that, that interest I've had in animals, mm -hmm. even as a kid, but going through up through high school, uh, there, there was nothing about that general interest in in animals and biology that they tried to stifle or you know were not supportive of so that, right. that's kind of just a, a general general support but more specifically when i got to purdue university and was in the the bird lab specifically the postdoc that i worked for her name's amanda ensminger she was i would say that she was the first person that i can specifically say really played a major role Mm -hmm. in really fostering my my interest and passion and then also really invested a lot in me developing professionally in right. in in, uh, in animal research and i say that just because she could have very easily not have uh, tried to get me as involved in the research experiments and actually like running the experiments as mm. she did, but she mm -hmm. like was very adamant, like this would be really, really good for you to take on that more of that responsibility. Right. And 
and get get that experience. And then she also really encouraged me to present my work at a couple conferences, and that was also excellent. And then also she really assisted me in the application process to grad school mm. when I was applying to Georgia Southern University. So the, the application process is different than typically when you're applying to just go to school for an, for an undergraduate degree and yeah. that you, you typically, unless you're doing like rotations, that's kind of a little different, but in a lot of like ecological um, research in biology departments, you usually yeah. often will try to meet your advisor beforehand and get a feel for their research, but also how they run the lab, what are typical expectations they have of their students. And you try to try to build that relationship a little beforehand to give you the best idea of whether that school and lab would be a good fit or not. And so she helped, she helped explain all of that and she helped me figure out what the best questions to ask my potential advisor would be. She helped review my application materials. I, I went on a campus visit where I drove um 11 hours down to the university in one day wow uh stayed at my advice stayed at my uh advisor's house that night and then uh toured the campus and met with faculty and did all that the visit stuff the next right. day and then stayed at a grad student's house that well, that night and then the next day they drove all the way back 11 hours up to purdue and so that was, that was wow that was, a, that was a busy trip yeah um, and I had never, I had never driven anywhere near that length of time in, in one sitting before. Um, Man. so she, she also helped walk me through that, that process, uh, as well. And so I, I owe a lot, I owe a lot to her. Mm. Um, she, she was very, very nice and very, and very excellent, um, research scientist and, and postdoc at, at that time, but just also really, really clearly cared about my, my development and helped me helped me along in towards grad school. Um, and then beyond that, there's also people I, I have nothing but praise to give both my master's degree advisor and my current advisor. Uh, mm -hmm. They're, they're both very great. Um, we communicate well, expectations are very clear. Um, lot, lots of, lots of support and advice. Uh, so I would say, I would say my past and current advisors as well are, mm -hmm. are also great spot of support that's awesome i love that uh yeah so in your spare time either uh apart from from biology or or related to it what are some other hobbies that you enjoy uh to sort of relax and you know spend your spare time interestingly my biggest hobby uses the exact opposite part of my brain from all the the analytical side with yeah. my work and that is i am a musician and i play the trombone oh really actually yeah i started playing in middle school mm -hmm. uh, which is which is pretty typical for a lot mm -hmm. of a lot of students at that age and i have been playing ever since and that was like 2003 when i started so yeah it's been, been a little while <laughs> and my favorite kind of music is jazz i love mm -hmm. playing jazz i love listening to jazz and, and playing jazz when i get the opportunity but i'm i'm classically trained and so i enjoy playing in orchestras as well as wind symphonies uh chamber groups i actually met my wife in waycross georgia we were both playing in the pit orchestra for the local community theater groups musical performance that they do every spring yeah and so my wife my wife plays cello and so we actually met at the very first rehearsal for one of those one of those musicals that's awesome and so it's actually th through music that i met my wife um which i've, I've always loved and that's great so i've yeah enjoy playing trombone i also i also enjoy playing chess okay which i yep i learned as a kid but really didn't seriously kind of get into until much more recently than than playing trombone i think it was you know, like 2018 or something like that yeah I kind of started playing playing more online chess, but I also I, I prefer playing people over over the board over real life. Person. Yep. Mm -hmm. So that that's kind of a little more you know analytical, but mm -hmm. uh, I I really enjoy that as well. Fantastic! I love that. Um, great game. You know, just classic. Uh, exercises your brain really well. Um, yeah, and it totally makes sense that a scientist would be into chess. It's like goes hand in hand. I often <laughs> find so. Um, yeah, so cool. I love that. Uh, so what are your, uh, big plans for the future after you graduate? Like what, 
what are some research you want to do? Uh, are you sort of keeping an open mind? Uh, any trips you want to go on? Anything like that? What are your What are your big plans? So I want to get a, want to get a teaching focused position in higher education, and I, my wife and I are not particularly uh, pinned down to any specific location. I would probably prefer to stay in the United States, mm -hmm. and but in terms of where what region go I'd like to go to. Uh, my a lot of my family is still in the Indianapolis, Indiana area, mm -hmm. but her family is kind of like spread out in different locations. And so some sometimes where people's families are, but you know, plays a role, of course, and where of you course, ultimately yeah. decide to pursue a career, you know, or raise a family and that that type of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so that that's something that's something that's something that I would consider. But uh, and also the kind of university that I like to work at it, like for example, a smaller liberal arts college versus a larger like research institution. I'm also up for kind of either of those or anything in between. Um, it would just depend on what the the specific duties and responsibilities are for the position that they're looking to fill, and right. whether that kind of aligns with what I think I would be able to to flourish in. And mm -hmm. I, in terms of the kinds of research questions, I'd like to to pursue in the context of mentoring students and giving them opportunities to, to do research. I fairly open to, of course, animal behavior questions, but even some more, some questions that more broadly fall under just like ecological questions. Right. Uh, I'm, I'm also open to, uh, and I would, would love to be able to teach courses that are specific to my, my, my interests like animal behavior, but I, I have experience teaching general biology and microbiology um, so I'm kind of flexible, flexible there as well. Uh, and then you asked about, uh, trips as yeah. well. Yeah. Right. I mean, I'd love to be able to travel abroad and mm -hmm. see, travel abroad and, and specifically go to, to, to beautiful, like natural areas, natural, natural landscapes, uh, something in the U S I'd love to go to. Glacier National Park, yep, which is uh, in like Montana, mm -hmm. northern northern part of the country, or like the Banff National Park in Canada. Yes, I've heard is also like quite beautiful. Yep, um, those both of those kinds of those sceneries really really appeal to me, and um, I do I do love I do love, love also love like hiking to some extent. I don't like do it too terribly often, but I do enjoy hiking as well. Great, yeah, I love that. Um, so cool. Uh, I love the. Uh, love the travel plans. Um, I love exploring the natural world as well. So um, really awesome. Yeah. So uh, George, uh, before we wrap this up, um, was there any place that uh, us viewers can go to uh, maybe learn more about about you online? Um, so yeah. So specifically, kind of about like my work. Mm -hmm. um, I don't. I don't really have like great social media necessarily to follow. Yeah. However, there are a couple of recommendations I would have to anyone who's interested in learning a little more about, uh, for example, why St. Louis actually is a great city to study um, urban insect pollinators. Uh, and so that would be a nonprofit organization called Seed St. Louis mm -hmm. has been around since the eighties and they, they're just in St. Louis, but they're an organization that strives to provide both uh, education and, and service to people who manage community gardens, community orchards, and also school gardens. I love and that. And so they give, they, they kind of educate on how to, to maximize like food, uh, fruit yield in gardens and orchards and kind of different things, native things you can plant mm. uh, at different times of the year. And so it's actually through uh, seed St. Louis that I have met met a couple few uh, people who I've asked questions about to get some more knowledge, foundational knowledge about insect pollination in the St. Louis area. That's awesome. Uh, and then also I would recommend to people uh, one of the other PhD students in my lab, uh, Jeremy Howard. He actually hosts a podcast of his own called That Sa That That Science and Nature Show. Okay, and he hosts it weekly and with with co he co-hosts it with two other 
uh, graduate students in, sci in, the, in the science departments that are here at UMSL. I love that. And the, the goal is just to have discussions about different topics in science and nature uh, at a more general level without too much like technical jargon. Um, mm -hmm. And to also just have guests on week by week that kind of provide some cool insight into uh, different topics that range from science education to uh, the validity of scientific conspiracies. I mm. mean, that's kind of a wide range of, wow. <laughs> of topics yeah. that are covered, but um, some pretty interesting topics in, I love in that. my opinion. So, yeah. That's so awesome. Um, well, thank you for giving that shout out. That's that's super great. Uh, well, George, uh, thank you so much for being on the show. Uh, this was super fun, uh, super interesting about hoverflies and all the all the crazy animals you've worked with in the past. Uh, really awesome. So thank you so much again for being on the show. Yeah, thank you so much, Braden, for having me. It's been a pleasure.